this recording over here. On today's Techno Babble, Video Codex. is Tech No Babble, your weekly source for church video and graphics news, perspectives, tips, and tricks. And now, here's your host, Paul Clifford. Hey, everybody, and welcome again to another thrill-packed episode of Tech No Babble. I know, maybe not thrill-packed, but that's okay. Hey, join the live conversation. one 3246 is the voicemail number. You can leave a message there. Uh, that's also one eight seven seven pod echo to echo back to this podcast if that helps you. Or you can drop me a line on email, paul at trinitydigitalmedia.com. Here, let me go ahead and put that up on my lower third so that you can see it. That's P-A-U-L at Trinity, T-R-I-N-I-T-Y, D-I-G-I-T-A-L-M-E-D-I-A dot com. And I'll be happy to discuss things with you there. Or you can join the live chat. This show re records weekly at, on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific on churchtechcast.com. By the way, if you haven't, head over to Amazon, A-M-Z-N, or if you're in a country other than the U.S., A-M-Z-N dot T-O slash Paul Clifford to take a look at my books, Podcasting Church, Tweeting Church, or The Serving Church. Those are all available there, and you can get either paperback or the Kindle version, whichever you would prefer. So, without further ado, let's get started. Codex. Now, this is one of the little pieces of minutia in videos, but it, it's really important, especially in a web world, because not every video codec is good for every situation. So, let me step back and let's talk a little bit about video codecs. A video codec is the set of instructions your computer uses to compress and decompress a video that it has recorded. You might know that there is actually a lot more video information than you typically get if you're watching YouTube or if you're downloading a video. What they've figured out how to do is compress that information so that it takes up less space. Less space on your hard drive, true, but primarily when we're talking web video, the purpose is less space, less bandwidth, less, less time to download it, if you want to think of it this way. So that's really kind of a big deal. But not all codecs are created equally. So some are better for some things, while others are better for other things. So let's talk basically about the two kinds of codecs. This is at least how I think about them. Is I think that there are delivery codecs and there are editing codecs. So if you want to think of it as there are there's two ways to have a video encoded. One that makes it easier to edit it, and one that makes it easier to deliver it. Of course, the editing one doesn't, it doesn't care as much about hard drive space. So there, it 
cares more about representing the video accurately. So an example of a good video codec is any of the ProRes codecs from Apple. So ProRes 4444, which includes all the information, ProRes 422LT, which is kind of a scaled down version, ProRes 422, uh, they're just all good codecs for editing. And the reason that they're good for editing is they include every single frame. Now what you might not know is if if you're watching this on YouTube, for example, I want you to take a look at the frame of video that you're watching. Look at it. Okay, you can see my, uh, if I point to it. I'm trying to do this kind of mirrored. Okay, there we go. Right up there, my churchtechcast.com sign. That doesn't change. Uh, some of the books behind me in this bookcase, they don't change. So, why would you have every single bit of information in every frame of video when you could just have basically my head and shoulders that change. So that's the difference between a delivery codec and a editing codec is an editing codec tends to have every bit of information in every frame so it's really simple to say okay I want frame 22 here and then I want to skip to frame 13 20 seconds later. And those frames are in, in their entirety. It's completely just a still picture, really. So that makes it very easy on the software when you're editing. Unfortunately, as I said, that's a bigger file. Because what delivery codecs, in contrast to editing codecs, do is they try and save space. So there will be what's called a keyframe, a frame where it is everything. And every once in a while, you will have a new keyframe. But every other frame is just the differences. So the background would remain the same and it would just look at the differences of my face, my hands, my shoulders, my t-shirt as I'm breathing, my neck uh, as I'm speaking. All the movement in the frame would be rendered for each frame or the differences between the, the movements would be rendered for each frame. But that would save you a lot of space. So if you wanted to think of it this way, in the old days with hand-drawn animation, what they would do is they would have a background and the background would remain constant. And the foreground characters, those would move and that would save you a lot of time and trouble over basically drawing the background every time and you had to make it the same and then drawing the character in the foreground slightly different. So the way they did this was with uh, clear celluloid or clear plastic and then they would paint over the clear plastic and then just replace the uh, thing that changed every time. Now it could be that you'd have a character that would be walking along in the in the background and so they would have a very long roll of the background so that they could roll it as the character is walking and stop it when the character stopped to talk to another character. So this is basically the thinking behind a delivery codec is they separate out the two pieces, the foreground and the background. In the foreground things tend to change so that's what gets changed from frame to frame and only that information. The background information, since that doesn't change, they just reuse it over and over and over again. 
So that's the difference between a delivery codec and an editing codec. Now, nowadays with uh, programs like Final Cut 10 and uh, more modern editors, more modern editors can easily edit delivery codecs like H.264, which is probably the most ubiquitous delivery codec. And it's H.264 is also used for, well, let me shift in my seat a little bit, get more comfortable. H.264 is also used for recording on devices like DSLRs. I've got my DSLR packed up, uh, ready for a video shoot tomorrow. But what that means is you can take the file, copy it to your hard drive, and just start editing immediately if you're using Final Cut 10. So on Tuesdays and Wednesdays when I shoot a show with my DSLR, I just copy that off of the card, stick it into uh, onto the hard drive, and then edit it with Final Cut 10. Now, if you've got an older version of software or one that doesn't like the delivery codecs, the ones that don't have all the information, what do you do in that case? Because you'll notice that as you're watching the video, your eye can't tell that the background has stayed the same. So what do you do in that situation? This is what we call transcoding. So what you're doing is you're taking a video with one codec and changing it into a video with another codec so that it works better. Now what I use a lot for that myself, and this is a cross-platform uh, piece of software, it is called MPEG Stream Clip. So M-P-E-G space S-T-R-E-A-M C-L-I-P, and that's free. So whether you're using Mac or Windows, you should be able to download MPEG Stream Clip and you can do things like rip from a DVD that maybe you made in the past because a DVD is the consummate example of a delivery codec. A DVD, you might think if you're not into video, is, oh, you just take the video file, you drop it onto the DVD, you're done. Nope. That would be too easy. Uh, a DVD has several files here. I think, no, I removed that off my main hard drive. But uh, you have files like uh, VOB files and all sorts of files that I don't even know off the top of my head which file goes where and all that stuff because I don't create a uh, DVD by hand. I don't go through and, and kind of transcode the file and then rename the extension and put it in the right directory. No, there's software that does that. So MPEG Stream Clip is good for taking that delivery mechanism and turn it in, turning it into something that you can use. So I'm in the middle of a project right now from a, um, a ministry in India, and they want to make uh, just kind of some highlight videos about the different things that they do. Well, they've pre presented to me DVDs. Unfortunately, I've got to spend some time transcoding those so that they can be edited because the audio and the video are separate, which, if you think about it, makes perfect sense because you can have several languages on a DVD. So the audio and video are separate, so those need to be married together. And the video files themselves are in these specialized delivery formats where you have a keyframe and all the differences for several frames and then another keyframe and then all the differences so that needs to be transcoded to something that is much more usable and that is I guess it's just one of the pitfalls of doing video 
is if you don't have the original, but you only have the delivery mechanism, then it could be that the, the delivery mechanism is the thing that you're using to um, to edit later on. And we see this all the time in archived videos where people archive the delivery file because it's much smaller, right? Or you've got a DVD, or you've got the, uh, the tape from way back when. You've got all those things, so you have to change them from one format to another. Now... You might be thinking, well, I remember when I had um, I had mini DV tapes when we were first getting into digital video, and there was no transcoding. I just captured it and good to go. Well, the capturing process was kind of a transcoding. It took the file and turned it into either. Uh, a QuickTime file or an AVI file depending on your operating system and then it would be editable. Now it, the recording format was much more like an editing format than modern recording mechanisms are. So there was less work on the computer to transcode that but you still did change the wrapper. And let me define that real quick. A codec, like H.264 or ProRes 444 or any of those, those are the instructions used by the computer to compress and decompress, compress, co, decompress, deck, compress and decompress the video so that you can watch it and so that it can be stored. But which piece of software uses that, that is kind of up in the air. So on Windows, we see a lot of AVI files, we see a lot of WMV files, whereas on the Mac, you see QuickTime files, which tend to be MOV. Now, you might also notice that there are M4V files, MP4 files. Those are all wrappers. They're sets of instructions that say, hey, this software is what you want to use for this. Embedded in that is the codec, which the software also has to have. So you might, from time to time, run into a file that says, hey, yeah, I'm a QuickTime file, and you open it in QuickTime and it doesn't work. Or, hey, yeah, I'm a Windows Media file, and you open it in Windows Media Player, and it doesn't work. And the reason is because the codec isn't also present, and the codec is very important for the process. So just having a file that claims to be the right wrapper format doesn't guarantee that you can have, that you can play it back, you can edit it, you can use it if it's the wrong codec. And sometimes people use specific codecs for specific reasons. I've talked about ProRes 444 and H.264 primarily, but there's a mess of codecs. Some codecs are better for animation, um, and I'm thinking PhotoJPEG as an example of that. There are open source codecs. Uh, Google is really trying to get video on the web to be WebM, which is an open source codec, but it's not as prolific. So you usually have to download that, or it might be included in Chrome when you get it. But a lot of times, depending on your computer, you wouldn't necessarily have that. So it's an extra step, uh, an extra bit of friction that you have to overcome. So I hope that these pieces of information, I, I recognize that they're minutia. I recognize that it's a lot of stuff that you really don't want to deal with. But next time you run across a video that you're having trouble editing, or you run across a video you're having trouble viewing, even though it appears to be the right format, it could just be that you need to install the appropriate codec. 
So um, I don't know if you can do this in Windows, but on OS 10, one of the good ways to do this is you can get information about the video file and it will often list what codec it is. So more than once I've seen someone export a video that they did themselves on one machine and then they go to show it on another machine and the other machine that they go to show it on doesn't have the codec installed so it doesn't work. And this was a bigger problem because Final Cut Pro used to edit completely in um, digital video codecs and they weren't as common unless Final Cut Pro had been installed on another machine. So I ran into this all the time. This might be something that you would run into as you're using ProPresenter for example. If you don't master to something very common like H.264, which tends to be a smaller file anyway. Now, I haven't talked at all about bit rates, encode rates, variable, variable, my mouth didn't want to work there, variable bit encoding versus constant bit rate encoding. All those things are other little aspects of the video file. But today we're just talking about codecs and I hope that this information is helpful to you as you're going out to change eternity. Until next time, this is Paul Allen Clifford with TrinityDigitalMedia.com. Right